Yeah, I just feel so honored to be here with all of you and have this opportunity to share a brand new song that came from Jesus only a few days ago. And uh, yeah, I started hearing the melody in my mind. And then I said to Jesus, what about the words? And then I heard, pick up the cards. And my eyes went on, um, some of you might have this, um, like a box of cards with course quotes on them. And then I just started picking up the cards and, and this song came out of that. So yeah, and it's called uh, You Will Find Heaven. Only 
love you will see nothing else see nothing else you will find heaven everything you seek but this will fall away you will find heaven when you want don't we love you will see nothing else see nothing else but love oh thank you so much thank you beautiful Beautiful. Ah, what a wonderful way to come into the holiday season together and, and yeah, thank you Swaba, that was a beautiful, beautiful song. Yeah, what was coming to me when Swaba was singing You Will Find Heaven was the line just kept coming into my mind that uh, so, so little is asked of you and yet I offer you everything. And so basically that's why we're joining together again to remember that everything, heaven, is offered us. And, and in exchange we're asked for our willingness to open up and to expose and to let go of the ego. So that's not really, it shouldn't be a difficult trade, <laughs> to trade a death wish for eternal life. Uh, you might say with, within the dream, uh, to the dream characters, uh, this is a frightening proposition because uh, the dream characters don't really know this, but unconsciously they believe that heaven is death <laughs> and it's the end of the mini-me. And that's why uh, a whole life dedicated to survival seems to be uh, threatened by heaven because heaven is perceived as, as death. When actually it's the death wish of the ego and the false identity that is the death and very little is asked of us to remember the truth of who we are. And a lot of us are used to building skills. Uh, we were talking uh, um, there, I think it was Holly was working on her PhD. There's a lot of things in this world require a lot of work, seemingly. A lot of steps, a lot of study, a lot of practice, a lot of uh, effort and a lot of energy. But uh, yeah, we, you were just listening to Swaba. That was her first, first guitar. Yeah. She actually, uh, she, she just started, picked up the guitar. Uh, in the community we have pass around guitars. We've had like a red guitar and yeah. brown guitars and so she got hand-me-down guitars because she just one day felt, I'm supposed to play the guitar. That, that was not long ago. No, in May. In May. <laughs> in May she felt, I'm supposed to play the guitar and then she got hand-me-down guitars and then I was just down on a, a miracle mission with, uh, with Ricky and Svava and Emily and, and uh, the mission was to pick up a guitar for Ricky for her world tour uh, that's coming and a guitar for Svava and that was it, the black guitar. But it just shows how, really how little of, is asked of you in the sense that yeah she just picked it up, started strumming it and really without what we would call like guitar lessons or whatever she just intuitively uh, let Jesus use her fingers and strum on this instrument and now uh, here we are in December and she's receiving songs and playing the guitar. And, and this is kind of a symbol of how it can go in your life. You shouldn't be thinking, oh my gosh, if I'm going to open to holiness, that's like climbing Mount Everest and it could, I better have a lot of ropes on the way and a lot of picks 
and a big support team because I don't know, I'll probably freeze before I get to the top of, of Mount Everest, you know, because it seems like a gigantic uh, thing to go for the atonement and to go for salvation. But actually, it's really not. And that's what I'd like to talk about today because I have to tell you honestly and very sincerely that that very little is asked of you. It's, it's a giant reward of experiencing yourself as, your, as the Christ, who you are in eternity. But honestly, I have to say very little is, is asked. And a lot of times people will say, you know, well, I don't know if, if you can really say that, David, because, you know, you picked up the course in 1986 and you've been at this for uh, some decades and maybe if you, if you were willing to speak and travel and do all these things and, and you were sent on many busy doings and everything, it seems like a lot. And you do quote that passage from the Bible to those who much is given, much will be asked. But today I'm going to talk about, actually, if you go a little bit deeper, you'll start to realize that even that much will be asked is not quite what you think it is. And it only seems like much because of your investment in the learning of this world. If you perceive yourself as an intelligent human being, that's, that's a roadblock. That's a big one. That's gonna, that will turn into a much. If you, if you have adapted and adjusted to the world's laws and now you think you are a, a well-functioning, fully functioning, a citizen of the world, you, you pay your taxes, sometimes you even help your landlady take the garbage out, like Morpheus said, you go to church, you do all these things, you work hard, you build portfolios of stocks and bonds, and you're really buffeted against disaster, you've got your life insurance, your health insurance, and you are so successful that the ego is going to have a hard time taking you down on the wrestling mat because you have adapted so well to the world that you're well defended. Now if that's the case, it could seem like much will be asked of you <laughs> because that's a big puff. That's a big puff of nothingness I've just described. You know, that's success in the world, but that's a big puff of nothingness and Jesus has got to find a way to dissolve the entire puff. <laughs> So, so that you realize that you're the Christ. But I have often said to you that I do meet people as I travel around the world. Uh, I meet the 12-steppers, I meet people who are into pretty severe addictions sometimes, and they are really down and out. I have had wonderful encounters uh, on urban uh, environments, cities, when I go out and meet the homeless people. And uh, I have wonderful encounters with homeless people. They seem to recognize me. I was on the streets of Cincinnati one time and this homeless uh, lady came up to me and she was all smiling and gave me a big hug and she says, where have you been? I have been waiting for you. And almost like she was seeing a dear, dear old friend. And believe it or not, the world is backwards and upside down. So some of these homeless people are not what you think. They're actually, they decided to quit playing the game of the world and they actually just enjoy being spontaneous and floating around and seeing what garbage bin they're going to get their food from. They're actually having a pretty good time. You may think they're the derelicts of the world, but uh, some of them are quite spiritually advanced <laughs> because they, they've chucked it all <laughs> pretty quickly and they're just enjoying their time uh, on the streets in some semblance of freedom. They still, until you forgive this world and you release time and space, you're really not free, but they, they're doing pretty well. And then a lot of the 12-steppers the that I've seen that bottom out, they hit rock bottom, they, they become so disillusioned with the world, they, they start doing the 12 steps and they jump right in, you know, that their life is unmanageable that they're, they're powerless over their addiction, they're powerless over their world, and they somehow know it, and then they dive in to this healing program, this recovery program, and they zoom quite quickly toward the kingdom of heaven. 
because they have had such a huge contrast experience of this intense emotion, this intense disillusionment uh, that has come seemingly related to their addiction. And then they go through uh, a, a big transformation. I've often said a lot of these people that I meet, the ones that I meet in the world that are really down and out and have gone through a lot of pain and suffering, they're only once removed from reality. The rest, the successful ones, are twice removed from reality, but they think they're gliding down the highway when in fact they're slip sliding away, as Paul Simon and, Gar and Garfunkel once wrote. So, but today I want to talk about a friend of mine uh, who's in prison. I've mentioned him. You know, years ago, uh, our community stays open to these movies, awakening movies, and years ago we heard about this movie called Hurricane. And we heard, you got to see Hurricane. So I watched it, the whole group watched it. We were blown away. You know, this was a true story, so to speak, based on, on a boxer, Hurricane Carter, who was basically, in terms of the world, unjustly imprisoned for a crime he did not commit. He was completely framed and he was a, a very promising uh, boxer, a very skilled boxer, uh, who was basically put away uh, on this kind of schemed up uh, uh, charge that, that really he, for something he didn't do, and he was put away. And he wasn't put away for a couple months or a couple years. He was put away for many, many years. And the movie is about him facing all of his anger, facing all of his despair in prison, facing his disillusionment, uh, his relationship um, uh, that he had before uh, deteriorates. Um, he's just in prison and he feels pretty much like a lot of prisoners, I think, feel that they're just wasting away, like they're locked up and wasting away. Now, some of you have heard me talk about Mohandas K. Gandhi. You know, Gandhi actually had something in common with Hurricane Carter. Gandhi actually spent a lot of years in prison. Mandela spent a lot of years in prison. And you've heard me talk about it's not being, having a body in a prison cell is really not where the imprisonment is because the imprisonment's in the mind. The mind that believes in the ego is imprisoned. It can be very successful in terms of the world. It could be the President of the United States. It could be a wealthy person. It could be a person with a lot of fame and fortune, skills, abilities. But the imprisonment is in the mind. So I, I think the examples of Mandela and Gandhi show us that you can't really be imprisoned unless you choose to be imprisoned. It's that imprisonment is a choice in mind. And uh, Gandhi was a great example because he was so standing for his principles that if it came down to him standing for his principles and being put away for what was some schemed up, uh, unjust, crazy rule that the British had made up, uh, he would rather go to prison. He would, he, you see Gandhi with his, his wrists coming together like this. If he stood up for the truth, if they said, that, that is not the truth, that is sedition, you are under arrest, you will go to prison, he would smile and put his hands out like, if this is what you're arresting me for, take me away. I love standing for truth. I will stand for truth. I will not buckle uh, in my stance of truth and uh, nonviolence. And uh, he happily, in fact, there are stories when Gandhi went to prison, you know, he he would uh, exchange uh, recipes with the cooks, vegetarian recipes, come up with new recipes. He was actually having a really good time in prison. Uh, he did most of his writing. He did all kinds of journaling. He did his healing journey basically mostly in prison, and so did Mandela. And Hurricane Carter from the movie Hurricane, he did too. You can see him going through all these emotions and then as the movie goes on and on, still no sense of release, no sense of release. 
Uh, I noticed the books that he was reading. I was like watching the movie very carefully. I was like, well, stop, freeze frame, as I noticed a Krishnamurti book <laughs> in his cell. And I was like, whoa, he's going off the deep end in self-realization. He's locked up for years and years and he's studying Krishnamurti. Oh my God. And then finally, in that movie, Hurricane, you know, there was a young man who found his book. He wrote a book in prison and at a used book sale, this young black man, uh, this boy from, uh, who was up in Canada, found his book on a, in a pile of books and read it and actually was part of going to visit him in prison. It was a huge holy relationship that started and ultimately uh, this young man was very instrumental along with a few other Canadians that he lived with at, at uh, having Hurricane Carter released from prison. But there's a famous line in that movie when, when the young boy visits uh, Hurricane in, in jail and they're in jail and it looks pretty bad. It looks like uh, he's not going to get out and, it, and the, the young man is very disturbed. And Hurricane Carter says to him, fear put me in here and love is going to bust me out. So th this was a tremendously helpful movie because it's based on, on experiences of this boxer who basically uh, didn't give up and um, actually used his time in prison for the awakening. So you may look at your own life circumstances and you may say, oh, I'm caught, my, my life is stressful, it's too busy, I have all these things that are happening to me every day and it seems like a struggle to stay on track sometimes, to stay aligned with the Holy Spirit. I think for many people who, who are really wound up into the ego belief system, that their daily life is like this carnival game. Do you remember, ever remember the carnival game where the little popping heads would come up and you had a little hammer or a little bunker and you had to keep bonking down the popping heads, you know, you would just, they pop up every day and you bonk them down and you bonk them down. That's actually pretty close to most people's experience of daily life. They have popping heads coming at them from the boss, from the neighbor, from the, the cat or the dog, from, from all kinds of experiences. There's just popping heads and they've got their bonker ready. Some of you know, you've got a pretty big bonker. You've, over a few decades, you've built up a pretty good bonker. Maybe it's padded, maybe it even has feathers on it, but you, you really enjoy whacking those heads down when they come up, like, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, I think Teresa was saying last night, she, ego tried to come at her, she zonked him with ibuprofen twice. Wham! Ah! I gotcha again. I tell you, don't mess with me. I'm going for God and, and I'm not going to be afraid of even taking ibuprofen. That's right. I'm a spiritual person. I'm taking an ibuprofen and get out of there. I'm not messing with you. And so actually most people say that's what my life is. I, I'm a pretty good bonker uh, with these popping heads. And, and yet I would say that like with Hurricane Carter, you know, he... He was basically a, uh, a captive audience for Jesus. You know, he, he was a captive audience for spirit because he was, his body's gone nowhere. And in one sense, in certain cases with being in prison, it's almost like the mind has decided to peel away a lot of distractions, survival mechanisms. You don't really worry about your career when you're in prison. You don't worry about getting a, a, a minimum uh, wage job and, and flipping burgers at McDonald's when you're in prison. Uh, in many cases, people in prison, it's like the, the environment that has been generated, uh, to the world it's like hell, like too bad. They're incarcerated, they're institutionalized, and they're locked away in the key, and they may not get out, or they may not get out for many years. And so to the world it's too bad. But actually, if you look at it as a, as a stripping away of distractions where you have to face your thoughts 
you have to face your emotions. You have to face your beliefs because it's just that body sitting in that cell or occasionally getting to go out and take a walk in the yard. But that body is going nowhere. And, and imagine what it's like for the ego, because the ego wants to use the body for all these distractions, huge trillions of distractions. And when you're in prison, then you do have an opportunity, not to say that uh, it's still, the ego can't use that environment as well, because the ego will try to use anything. But you, you do have a, 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 a minimizing of, of distractions. So anyway, a few years ago, I don't know how many years ago it was, uh, I start getting um, messages. I started getting letters, typed out letters, from a man in prison, and the man's in prison, and he says, I was a boxer. And I'm like, uh-oh, a, a boxer from prisoner writing to me. And he says, I was a pretty well-known, he ended up doing prize fights on ESPN sports. You know, he was not just your amateur kind of boxer that's, you know, in the ring in the local gym like Rocky Balboa or something. This is somebody who fought uh, championship fights on ESPN, Sports Network. And so he again, like Hurricane, was a, a very prominent boxer. And he's writing to me, he says his name is Dale, and he's writing to me from prison, and uh, his wife is Holly, and she is uh, he, handling a lot of, some of his, his correspondences and, and visiting him occasionally. But, but he writes to me, and he pour, starts to pour his heart out, and he said, I've come across, I came across uh, some of your, your writings and your books, and he just starts eating it up. I mean, he starts going through these books, and then he orders A Course in Miracles, and now he's in prison for years and with years to come with A Course in Miracles, with, with my books, and, and he is... He is not just reading these, he is soaking these up fully because he starts to realize that there is a hope and there is a purpose for him that uh, doesn't require much at all. It just requires his focus. It requires his willingness. It requires his attention. It doesn't require a lot of money. He's, he's in prison. He doesn't have a lot of money. It doesn't requ require him to do a lot because he doesn't have a lot of physical mobility. He's, he's incarcerated in Chillicothe, Ohio, at, a, at a, a prison, a penitentiary there, and he just starts to go into this. And so occasionally I receive these type, type letters uh, basically just clarifying with me what he's reading because he's going through these deep experiences. And then uh, he goes as the time goes on and the months go on and the years go on, he just goes deeper and deeper and deeper into this experience of holiness. Uh, he, he simply is using his willingness, his desire in his mind with what has been given him, is his uh, seeming situation. We all have seeming situations in the world, but Dale his name is Dale Crow, and he's actually in there doing that. So I thought I would uh, just, I haven't heard from him for quite a while, but I got a handwritten in red, red letters, a handwritten letter uh, from Dale. And uh, it really touched my heart, and I thought, wow, this, I should read this on the Birth of Holiness retreat. Because here's someone who's in prison and he's working it. And I look at you, I see all the faces out there, you're all working it. And Dale's working it, but I'm just bringing Dale up here because Dale, I don't think Dale has so many popping heads going on <laughs> in his life. He's, he's watching his thoughts, he's diving in to his mind. He is a captive audience for spirit and He's been reading the books, and this, these letters are always straight to the point. He doesn't mince words. You know, he just pours his heart out, and he pours his soul out, and he, 
he's writing, and the, the reason I thought I would bring it up at this session is uh, I'm down in Mexico, and I don't know if they, you know much about Mexico post office, postal system, but it's not easy for me to reply <laughs> to, to a letter like this from Mexico, but it, I'll get my chance. But I think some of you may want to write to him after you've had an experience of what he is, who he is, and what he's going through, because that is an opportunity for him, for all of us, to deepen in our practice. So here's what he wrote. He wrote this on, uh, right around Thanksgiving, he wrote this on uh, November 25th, 2018. David, hey buddy. Yes, it's me again, smiley face. Let me explain why I write to you. I know that no matter how crazy my letters may sound, I know that I won't be judged. And I know that each time a letter is received, I am seen exact, entirely new, smiley face. I also write you, David, because you are my guide and I need confirmation that I'm not off course or losing my mind. I've sincerely considered speaking to mental health because there aren't many people at all in my circle that I can speak to about this. In prison, prison has become metaphysical. No, it's, no, it's not metaphysical, it's metaphorical. Prison has become metaphorical for me. So he's reached that point where he's realizing that the whole prison scene is just a metaphor for his escape from the ego. He's reached that point where he's not waking up in the morning thinking another day of prison because the metaphor is the situation is just showing him what all human beings come to at one point, like this world is just a metaphor for the imprisonment of the mind and the need to wake up from this ego belief system. David, in this sense, I am only underlined concerned with going home, capital H-O-M-E, underlined. So he's talking about heaven. He's talking about what Svava was just thinking about, you will find heaven. I am, at this point, I am only underlined concerned with going home. I really no longer care about going home smaller h-o-m-e. So <laughs> the metaphor of prison now, he has completely taken it on board and, and there is no sense of, of wanting to leave prison, there is no sense of wanting to be released, there is no sense of wanting to escape, <laughs> like some of those other Shawshank Redemption, we've seen some other movies. There's no, nope, he's not He's not even like Timothy Robbins trying to plot a way out. He, has, he is no longer concerned. He has no care about going small age home. I think you understand what I mean. I do. <laughs> I'm not sad in any way, nor am I depressed. I feel joy and happiness within my being, and can be peaceful, loving and forgiving to all I see. My questions are, are all of these characters and personalities only me? This is what he's pondering in prison as he's watching, <laughs> watching the world. Like all of us are watching the world, are all of these characters and prisoners, and per personalities, only me. My own self reflected back to me, question mark. Everyone in my life is in my own mind. This is why the how I see them in my world, 
my dream is so important? Question mark. That's an important line. This is why the how I see them in my world, my dream is so important. There are people that read the Course and they, they really struggle with certain paragraphs. Like for example, there's an amazing paragraph in the Course, I am responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings I experience and I decide upon the goal I would achieve. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. Well, there's no blame and victimization in that. In fact, if you can accept that without reservation, you will be exceedingly happy for eternity because you would never blame anything or anyone in the world. But he's heard my talks because a lot of times people take that first question, that first statement from Jesus in that paragraph I just recited, I am responsible for what I see. And they think, oh my God, if I'm seeing competition and starvation and, and a world that's just falling apart and I am responsible for what I see, whoa, that's, that's hard to take responsibility for the perception of the world in a distorted way. And what I tell people is, really what Jesus means by I am, I am responsible for what I see is Jesus means I am responsible for how I see. How I see the world. That's my responsibility. I don't have to say, oh, I see a terrible world and I'm responsible for it, so woe is me. It's basically, I can choose to see the world clearly with the Holy Spirit. And the world I see is going to be the result of of what I want. If I want the Holy Spirit, if I want the Holy Spirit's interpretation of the world, I will see the forgiven world. I will experience the happy dream. But here he is saying, that is why the how I see them in my world, my dream is so important, question mark. He's asking, is that really that important? And, and it is, that we're, we're responsible. Sometimes people say to me, I, my life is in such a mess, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. Or, I wish I could forgive the world, but I don't know how. You see that how word comes in a lot. And I always say the Holy Spirit is the how. The Holy Spirit is the how. If you throw all your trust, all your faith in the Holy Spirit, then you've just solved the how. Because the how is already there. The Holy Spirit has already corrected this world. And if you put all your faith in listening to the Holy Spirit, then you don't have to worry about the how. Because the, the how is automatic. It's absolutely automatic as long as you put your faith and trust in. And here is Dale asking that. Is it because this is what will carry on with me. He's realizing that, that beyond this world, beyond this body, beyond this personality self, what will carry on with me, what will carry me into my awareness of the Christ Self, what will carry me all the way home to heaven is the Holy Spirit. That's the how. That's why guidance is so important. We always talk about guidance. We always talk about receiving and following guidance, because without that guidance, then the how becomes obscured. Then the how becomes pushed out of awareness. We don't know what the how is. In fact, as long as I am, quote, seeing these images and appearances, is it only consciousness? This is another huge leap to start to realize that what you're perceiving as this world is simply your consciousness. You're perceiving consciousness. Consciousness is not apart from the world you see. Consciousness and the world that you perceive are the same in the sense that my thoughts are images my, I have made. 
My meaningless thoughts are showing me a meaningless world, and my consciousness is, is literally what I perceive. It's not like there's a world, and then you have a consciousness apart from that world, that when you perceive anything in this world, you're just getting a motion picture of your consciousness. When you look at anything of this world, you're just seeing a motion picture of consciousness. If you want to know what's going on in your consciousness, just watch your thoughts, watch your emotions, and watch those images go passing by, and you're getting a, it's a, it's a picture, it's a, it's a motion picture of that consciousness. And he's, here he is in prison, no money, no health insurance, no life insurance, no freedom of the body. He's just there, a captive audience to spirit, and he's, he's asking me, are all these images I am seeing, he puts seeing in quotes, because he knows what, that it's not really this vision of Christ, it's just artificial seeing. This isn't, this isn't vision, this is just the seeing of consciousness. As long as I am seeing these images and appearances, is it only consciousness? You know, once you start to realize that you're just dealing with, with an awakening in your consciousness, with a healing, with a forgiveness going on in your consciousness, everything starts to get real simple. Everything. And I mean, you can start to see everything in the same light. I see Julie over there, her house burned down. Uh, you know, there's things that are happening in your lives. Dale's in prison, Julie's house burned down, and I, if I went around there, you guys have had some, ex some extreme things going on. But if you see this as consciousness, then you just say, hmm, okay, what, what, what's going on here? What do I value here? What am I valuing more than my Christ self here? If there's anything disturbing me, it must be that I'm simply valuing something of the world more than my Christ Self. That's all. It's really simple. So, so here is Dale. He's in prison in Chillicothe, Ohio, and he's coming to this realization that, that basically it's all consciousness. He's just dealing with consciousness. Oh, I have a bill that I can't pay. It's three months due, but it's only consciousness. Oh, I have a, a girlfriend that I haven't seen in five months, and we used to be so close, and now we don't talk, and I was hoping I could see her for Christmas, but, but she, she didn't write, to, write back to me. But it's only consciousness. Oh, I've been diagnosed with cancer, and I've been told I have three months to live. Well, but it's only consciousness. You know, you, we have to come, like Dale, to start to really go into this, what Jesus is teaching us in A Course in Miracles, is he's saying, there is no world apart from what you think. There is no world apart from consciousness, that consciousness and the world are synonymous, and that you can escape from the world that you see by giving up attack thoughts, by giving up judgments. Isn't that what Jesus taught us 2,000 years ago? He said, judge not, lest ye be judged. Don't judge anything about yourself or the world, otherwise you're going to be laying a judgment on yourself. And you're not going to know your Christ self. You won't know who you really are. You'll be accepting the ego's idols as gifts, instead of accepting your Christ self as a gift from God, that God gave you in creation. God created you holy and perfect. So he's talking then about consciousness, unmodified and impersonal, because the me that I speak of isn't real. Now he's realizing that the personality self, Dale, that he's been so concerned about, the boxer Dale, the, the imprisoned one who's serving out his time in, in prison, Dale, the Dale, the personality self is unmodified and impersonal because the me that I speak of isn't real. 
Well, that's going to really loosen your cares and worries. You know, you're not going to be bonking down those heads so much every day if it's impersonal. Imagine you could just sit there and watch the heads pop all day and have a good laugh. Oh, look at this. Maybe we can make a song out of it. Remember that song, Popcorn? <laughs> Throw the bunker away. Throw the hammer away. What is the, what is the point of trying to pound down popping heads every day when you can let go of the, the bonker, the judger, the, the corrector, the, the critic, the fixer, you know, and be, ah, oh, let all things be exactly as they are. All things work together for good. There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. You know, if you start, Jesus is giving us a symphony in A Course in Miracles, a symphony saying, just let all things be exactly as they are. See the divine perfection in everything. See that nothing is out of place, not a molecule, not an electron, not a star, not a planet, not a leaf, not a blade of grass. Nothing is outside of this divine perfectness, this, this divine flow, this divine harmony, this divine will. And so here's Dale, and Dale's in prison seemingly, but now he's realized it's just the prison of his mind, and now he is coming toward the escape hatch. And it's not about Dale's body getting out of, of a, a cubicle or getting out from behind bars. The escape is not in form. You will not escape from this world by moving the body from one location to another. I'll tell you that much. I've, I've traveled a lot and I, I can tell you I've been in millions of different locations and, the, and they're really all the same because it's all consciousness. It's all consciousness. It's only a construct that I made to feel accepted. Now he's talking about Dale as only a construct that I made to feel accepted. Isn't that interesting? Instead of thinking you were born to, to parents in this world, now you start to think of that personality self as a construct that I, the, the ego mind, made to feel accepted. You see, it's a self-concept. That's why people-pleasing is so important to the ego. That's why being liked by other people is so important. That's why adulation, recognition, awards, um, all kinds of advancement, pay increases, and all the things that go with the gold medals, you know, all the, the things of the world were all made to make a self acceptable. But actually, this self this small self will never ever feel accepted. And that's why no matter how much you achieve in this world, no matter how much you accomplish, no matter how high you rise in social status, no matter how much money you make, no matter how beautiful the body is, or how many skills and abilities you acquire, or mental capacities you acquire, or learning that you acquire, you will never ever feel accepted because as Dale, I'll quote the Prophet Dale, who's in Chillicothe now, it's only a construct that I made to feel accepted. Whew. Wow. That's a big one. This could end up being, Dale could have a little book. <laughs> the Writings of Dale from Chillicothe. You know, he's in there wondering if he's on the right track. <laughs> oh, he's more than on the right track. Yeah, he's coming close to the escape hatch in the mind. And he's doing it for all of us, and we're all there with him. We're all there experiencing this with him. Page two. I ask you if I'm headed in the right direction because I've lost interest in the world. Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> he's asking me, did I, did I blow it somewhere? I've lost interest in the world. Well, what did Jesus say about be passers-by? 
Has anybody ever read Lesson 128 from A Course in Miracles workbook? The world I see holds nothing that I want. Oh, Dale, you're, you're hitting the jackpot here. You know, he's, he's zooming in here in, in, in a big way and he's asking me, I ask you if I'm headed in the right direction because I've lost interest in the world. I've walked away from my life entirely. I did this because none of the things I walked away from really supported this path I've chosen. That, I'll have to read that again. He's giving the reason why he has no interest in the world is because I've walked away from my life entirely. I did this because none of the things I walked away from really supported this path I've chosen. In parentheses, family and friends. Now, for, for a lot of us who have a lot of interactions, we know here with our Living Miracles community that, that it's not about a, a walking away from or a letting go in terms of the form. It's really we're just letting go of the purpose. So when we have holy encounters, we have holy encounters with family, friends, people in the street, when we go to the market, we have them all the time. But you can just imagine if you were in a prison and your miracle capabilities were zoomed into, well, you've got this amount of time to do this, 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 this. We have a free reign. We use cameras, computers, we use emails, we're Facebooking, we're messaging, we're tweeting, we're having fun, we're using all these mechanisms of the world to radiate and shine this happiness and we seem to be interacting with a lot. We even call you our family. But imagine for Dale where he's just there and the witnesses that he's, he's seeing some, some witnesses, but many of those of his family, like his wife Holly and some of his friends, they think he should be trying to escape prison. They think he should be uh, having ambitions for the future. Like, what's the point? How do you endure prison unless what? You have a future. He's discovering how do you escape prison except in the present, the present moment. You see how different that is from a future escape? Does anybody remember that in the course, in the section called The Immediacy of Salvation? Jesus says, be not content with future happiness, for it is not your just reward, for you have cause for freedom now. Jesus is calling us into the present moment. He's saying, join me here now. Don't wait. Don't put it off until you achieve something. Don't think of spiritual enlightenment as a future uh, achievement. If you do, you're just going to... to have to realize that you still have a gap between now and the time when you forgive. That's all time is. That's all this projected, generated future is, is a gap in the mind between the solution, the forgiveness, the release of right now, this moment, the power of now that Eckhart talks about. This is where it's all at. And then when you keep looking to the future for escape, he's saying, no, it's your... You, you, you have cause for freedom now. And this is what Dale is going through now. He's actually zooming in. He doesn't have Living Miracles community. He doesn't have online retreats. He's not allowed to have online retreats. He's not allowed to have emails. He's not allowed to have anything electronic and digital. It's prohibited. And yet, without all of that, which we all are all so grateful for, guess what he's doing? He's doing what Jesus asked him to do. Join me. Zoom in. There's a Zoom. Now that's a real Zoom. This stuff is like, come on. This is not Zoom. This is Zoom. Dale is Zooming. You know, he's showing us, he's giving us a witness that you don't need a lot. He can't even do email. He, he has no, you know, he has no funds. He, he has no possessions. You know, he's, 
He's in what the world would say is a very controlled environment, but all of consciousness is controlled until you put it under Christ control. All of consciousness is controlled. All of our worlds are just as controlled as Dale's until we say, Jesus, you be in charge. You lead the way. You show me. You unwind me from this crazy belief system. I will give you my life. I give you my mind. I give you my heart. Holy Spirit, lead the way. Because this is just an example of someone who's basically decided, I'm going to go for it. In fact, it is some point where he must have read my books and he must have read the Course and he just, he started writing me and saying, wow, what I thought was spirituality wasn't really spirituality at all. He said, this stuff is deep and I'm going to go for it and I, I trust you and I trust Spirit and I'm going to go for it. And this is, we're now seeing the results of, of that going for it. As you can imagine, People assume I'm crazy, or institutionalized, he puts with a smiley face. This is fantastic. Imagine being called institutionalized and putting a smiley face after that word, you know. Now that's a state of mind. Somebody comes and says, you, you, you're institutionalized, you know. You should be locked up. You are locked up. You should be, be, be kept locked up. And he's smiling, smiley face. But you say to always ask, how does it feel? So this is what he turns it around is. He says, me, David, you say to always ask, how does it feel? I feel great in capital letters with exclamation. I feel great. He's using the one right use of judgment that Jesus says, how do you feel? And he says, I feel great. He's not concerned that people call him crazy. He's not concerned that people say he's institutionalized. It doesn't seem to be a problem. He doesn't seem to have a problem with that. I would say because of who he's listening to, his inner voice, and, and Jesus and the Spirit, you know, and he feels great. I love it. I feel great! Exclamation point. I can lose nobody, nor do I need to convince anybody of my beliefs. Wow, that'll help all of us for Christmas, right? I, I don't need to convince anybody of my beliefs. That helps with those family gatherings. And you can just go and enjoy the turkey and chicken and stuffing and whatever and just have a good time. If you're there to convince somebody about their beliefs, well, that's going to make it hell. <laughs> and Dale's not concerned at all about convincing anybody of the beliefs because they all reside within my being. It is all underlined, my own consciousness, projected outward for me to wake up. And then he says, is this delusional? <laughs> He's asking me. <laughs> I hope, if I give you his address, I hope you write to him and say, oh, listen buddy, you're far from delusional. You're making my day here <laughs> this Christmas. <laughs> you're giving me the greatest gift not in money, or possessions, or eggnog, or all kinds of foolishness, jewelry. He's given the greatest gift there is to give. Freedom. Freedom of mind. That, that Morpheus was talking to Neo about. I'm here to free your mind, Morpheus tells Neo. So he's offering quite some gift. So he's saying, even you, exclamation, you are me in my dream, guiding me home. Please help me, David, because if I'm right, then this letter wasn't ever necessary <laughs> because the life I am inquiring about was never real in an ultimate sense. Smiley face. <laughs> there goes the letter. Now he's forgiving the letter even. You know, it's like poof, poof, poof. It's all consciousness. I love you, buddy. And thank you for helping me. I need guidance. Take care and have a blessed and happy holiday! Exclamation. Merry Christmas! Exclamation. Always me. And then he puts, I apologize for my writing. My typewriter was sold. <laughs> After all these typed letters I got, I, this is the first hand letter. 
So now everything is taken away. Even the typewriter is gone. And that still doesn't stop him. He writes it with, in red ink, you know, he still continues on. So this is, I was blown away with Hurricane Carter, and then all of a sudden Jesus is like, well, I'll give you your own Hurricane Carter uh, symbol that you can correspond with and everything. So anyway, maybe we can take this down and put this up for later too, but I'm just going to, I'm going to give you his name, his P.O. box, and his his address. So if any of you feel guided, you can imagine the, the, the look on his face when he probably doesn't get any mail at all. <laughs> if this Christmas he ends up getting some letters just of what you felt in your hearts when the, hearing about Dale. So his, his name is Dale, D-A-L-E, Crow, C-R-O-W-E, kind of like Russell Crow. If you forget it, just think of Russell Crowe. Dale Crowe, P.O. Box 5500, Chillicothe. Now, I'm from Ohio, so I know how to spell it, but I'm going to spell Chillicothe because it sounds very native. <laughs> C-H-I-L-L-I-C-O-T-H-E. Chillicothe, Ohio. OH is the abbreviation, and the zip code is 45601. Thank you, Dale. Wow. That, so that's going to open it up for us today, because we, we can see how deep this goes, because of Dale's example. And we can see that, that we don't have to make this like a long and difficult thing, like waking up shouldn't be like pulling teeth. You know, it doesn't have to be that difficult. It only seems like a struggle. It only seems like a challenge to the ego who does not want to give up your mind. Basically, the ego is like a parasite that has taken over the mind. And now, when you're coming in with the solution, the, the antidote, the correction for the ego, the ego seems to be fighting and kicking and screaming a bit because it wants to control your mind, and actually that's not God's will. God's will is for you to have perfect happiness, to wake up, to remember who you are. So, so that is just like an example of, of, of someone who's, who doesn't seem to have much in ways of, of worldly attachments, and yet he's just using, with, in connection with the Holy Spirit and Jesus, he's just using what's presented to him every day to drop, to drop deeper and deeper into this certainty of identity of the Christ. So I think I will, uh, I will open it up now for uh, anything, if you were touched by that, if you have questions, if you say, well, that's working good for Dale in Chillicothe, but uh, my circumstances are a lot different uh, than Dale's. Uh, or whatever the, the questions and, and comments are, I think we can open it up and, and use the remaining time to really, let's go into this together. Let's, let's talk about what this, what this means to us and, and let's talk about what some of the ideas that were presented there in that uh, beautiful handwritten letter. Yeah, really deeply touching what uh, Dear wrote and... Um, I sort of, uh, I'm with him. I'm like completely with him. But I do find these days myself stuck in unwinding these unbearable feelings, um, of especially sin and guilt. And it seems to go on and on and on. And I know like with every unwinding, it's like um, we're, we're giving up control. Uh, I'm giving up control bit by bit. So it's, it's like practicing the holy instant. It's practicing being in the now. And I do see as well that um, I get hooked very quickly on people uh, doing the wrong thing. Um, you know, like basic, uh, basic uh, level uh, error. Um, 
And I can see that a part of me is still afraid to go into the unfamiliar and leave the world. I can see that a part of me still values the world. But moment to moment, instant to instant, situation to situation, that is not, that kind of knowing is not available to me. It's like, um, I don't know whether it's the desire to stay in the world, even though the world has been absolutely um, uh, unforgiving of my existence in it. Like I tried to hide in it, but the hiding didn't really work because my life has been very difficult. I don't know whether I'm still uh, there's still that attachment to the world that, that keeps this going on and on and on, or is it like I'm given a chunk of healing <laughs> to heal it for everyone, and maybe there's some victim victim victimhood here, and it's just so excruciating. I don't know if I'm making sense. I am a little bit all over the place now, but where where I am right now is just this unbearable, intense shame and, and fear. Um, and, and spirit uses like um, things that are happy in the dream, abuse, rape, etc., to remind me of the feelings to unwind them. But of course, when you're feeling shame, you believe it. You believe the dream is real and you believe that you are shamed and you push everyone away. So. I don't know if I have a question there. I just want to expose as much as I can because things do get on top of me. But thank you, Dale, yeah. and David, for bringing Dale into our life. I mean, I feel his spirit because for me, like I'm feeling sorry for him being in prison, but actually his letter, you know, I'm just so present to my own self-imprisonment in the time and space thinking that I'm still holding on to. So that is a mir miraculous scene. So really grateful. Yeah. Well, Mirna, thank you. And I think um, the, the way the spirit works is the spirit knows where we have things like really tightly wound beliefs that are like really guarded and protected. And the spirit knows that, um, you know, it, the spirit has to to come at us and convince us and use many ways, many miracles to kind of loosen that tightness um, because there's too much fear. And where there's too much fear, the spirit will wait. You know, the spirit is not intrusive in any way. The, the spirit, spirit never sends any kind of sentinels in like, okay, I've had enough, send in the sentinels and let's rip this thing apart. It, spirit never works that way. What I have found over the years is that um, even when the fear is thick and layered, uh, it's, a, it's amazing how the miracle can soften things up. Like, um, I remember I, I used to go to, uh, to uh, visit people in nursing homes, and, and a lot of times the nursing homes were very ritualistic, and there was like a down. Everybody was kind of down, moving slow, another day of inside the nursing home, Nothing ever changes, you know, that kind of a thing. And then I would watch, sometimes people would come in with animals. They would bring in four or five or six animals. And I would watch these people, well, I would see them for days and days. They were just in their chairs and they would hardly move. And the, their facial expressions would hardly change day by day, hour by hour. But when the animals came in, suddenly they started smiling and they were different characters, you know, it was like something as simple as bringing animals in to a nursing home. Amazing, absolutely amazing. That was miraculous for me to see how impactful that was. And so what I always say is the spirit knows exactly what the ego system is in the mind, what's believed in, it knows the preference package, it knows where there's those real tight spots, but there's you know how when you see something on Facebook or somebody sends you something and you watch it and you just suddenly involuntarily get a big smile to your face. It's like a ray of light just cracks through that tightness and, and shows you the truth is still there, even though it's, it's covered, even though it's been buried. And, and so for me, I, I'm always enjoying 
uh, coming across those things. And to me, that's what the miracle's about. Like I've said over the years, I said to somebody, come on, come with me, we're going to do this, or we're going to do that. And then all this joy, just burst of joy, comes out of this, this, this prompt. It's a very out-of-pattern kind of prompt, where it's just a given thought. And then just by going with that given thought, it just kind of opens up into like an ex a little mini explosion of joy. So just to be aware of those things. Um, if you get any kind of outer pattern kind of things that come in that are pretty easy, you know, it's the, not much is required of you, just to be very aware of those things. Because we're doing that in community all the time. We're always trying to tune in and, and pay attention to like an inspiring thought. Um, Kristen's here with me now, and, and we had this encounter with this guy named Derek. And this man, Derek, who I think I had heard him on, uh, on uh, YouTube, I believe. I'd heard an interview. I think I was on Facebook and I'd heard it. And he was talking with, uh, uh, about this movie, What Dreams May Come, and Cuba Gooding Jr., who, who's a friend of his, because they both had worked on this movie. Uh, years ago, and they started talking, 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 and then suddenly he started mentioning A Course in Miracles and like, wow, this book and this and this. So I got excited, so I think I, I made a comment on his um, YouTube channel, and then he reached out and sent an email, Derek did, to Kristen, and Kristen almost deleted it. She almost deleted it. But just a little nudge inside said, no, no, open this up. And, and she opened it, and it was this guy, Derek, who then invited me on his live streaming YouTube show. And we had this most miraculous experience. And I feel like it's a flowering of the spirit that just goes on and on and on. But it, it was just a little comment here, an email that wasn't deleted, and then all of a sudden, boom! So, Moon, I'm just saying, just, just stay open to those little nudges because, you know, the Spirit is, is coming through and it's reaching us and it's, it wants us to really crack wide open and, and it, we do have to be tuned into that. We just have to stay very tuned in. And if you think of it, if it took 2,000 years for Jesus to get A Course in Miracles into this realm, when I thought of that in the broader context, I thought, wow, 2,000 years to get the course through, I said, this ego fog must be pretty thick because the Spirit had to be patient, uh, you know, to find the right, just the right conditions, Helen Shuckman and Bill and, and all of us. <laughs> We're like a giant wave of, of love and light that's just like a meteor coming and hitting the planet or I think what we're doing right now, all of us, with the Course, is, is tantamount to about the same thing as when the Beatles started playing rock and roll and singing love songs. Uh, we're going to have that much impact, or more, on the world. This is the Beatles. So think of that. Just think of that, Muna, the next time it feels closed up, you know. Just think of Ringo. <laughs> 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 I'm so happy to be with you all and um, oh I would love to see uh, to see David because I, I um, on my screen I don't know if it's possible or not although I love you jo Jeff <laughs> um, thank you for that letter that letter is absolutely amazing um, it opens up my heart like so, so wide, so big, so huge. And it, it's, it's incredible because um, messages are coming to, to me or to us, I guess, at just what you said, in the most amazing ways and from the most surprising person. And um, I still have no home. I, um, it, it is a, a very fine line of, um, on one side, a lot of fear and shame 
and, and guilt and all that stuff, all that juicy stuff. <laughs> and the other side where it's pure joy. Um, and um, uh, last week in Vancouver, um, um, I met someone with my, um, with uh, a friend of mine, I met a homeless per person and the guy was having two puppets and he was just doing this with the two puppets and singing a song that I didn't know about. It's the first time because I, and it's the song that David, you sang yesterday saying, if you smile, um, uh, when you're smiling, the whole world smiles with you. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and he was just singing that, and we, we filmed it. Uh, and I, I will put that on my Facebook. You'll see the, the, the person. And we asked him, um, we listened to the song, and a few pictures and stuff, and we asked him, um, do you need something to, um, to get your your winter better, even though there's, you know, it, it's been like sunny, like, like my background picture I took a few days ago. And he said, no, I'm fine. And then he sang that song and we asked him again, two times. And he said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm all good. I don't need anything. And we laughed and we were like, and, and I, and then I, I look at myself feeling like scared of being homeless, <laughs> basically. <laughs> not knowing what's gonna happen, not knowing where I'm gonna live, almost to the, to the point of bankruptcy with my business. I don't know if I'm gonna sell or if I'm gonna do bankruptcy, I have no idea. All I know is I have a beautiful book here. <laughs> I, I, I journal, and I, and, and I, I have this beautiful book here, and with, um, with you wrote in it. I don't know if you can see that. I bought this yeah, book yeah. when I was in Mexico. And without knowing, Marga gave me a book from underneath and, and gave it to me. And then I leave, I go to my room and I open the first page. And it's you, David, who wrote Showers of Love, David. And I, I asked Marga, uh, uh, did he sign all the books like this? And she said, no. <laughs> So I'm, 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 that's my joy. That, that is pure joy. And so, and it doesn't take me much to get in joy. Um, like I can, I can go from a place of, of fear, darkness, and then, um, and then um, it, it takes like, small messages like small that that are not small actually that takes up all the room all my heart all my surrounding my yesterday i was in a park where the, it's full of light full of christmas light it, it's not a park it's a garden it's beautiful i felt i was in paradise and i was so full of joy and I was thinking, how can this be? Like, how, how can I be almost bankruptcy and no home? And I'm living at a friend's place, not doing much except meditate and, and being, having so much joy. <laughs> so um, <laughs> thank you for that letter. It's just the most beautiful letter I ever heard. It's, 
Thank you. Thank you. What's his name? Dale. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, yeah. David. Thank you, all my mighty companions. Julie, we love you so much. And wow, you, it's great the way your green screen is working there. You look more like Yoda. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're like giving us a Yoda message. <laughs> it's so beautiful. <laughs> you're reminding us, like I said, the, the bodies are just like little shadows in the sunlight. And spirit is playing with all of us. Uh, <laughs> It's a transmission from another world. <laughs> Yoda is re transformed. <laughs> Love you, Ju. Love you, Julie. Oh, thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> oh. Good morning, everyone, or, or good, af good afternoon and good evening. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that, first of all, the red letters, that reminded me of something I've heard from you, David, saying about the red letters in the Bible from Jesus. So the red letters kind of struck me that way um, and how they were so, how you so... Uh, so we're into the red letters. And so here Dell writes you in red letters. <laughs> um, also, I really can't identify with this Dell because in a sense, I'm in this same sort of situation. Um, during the first, very first uh, online retreat that you guys did, I, you, you guys are aware that I lost sight in my left eye. And so it, at that time it promptly, put me in a position where I cannot drive any longer. And so my car was sold, my beloved car. Um, and at the, when I had the car, I had no money. But now that I have no car, I have money. <laughs> it's pretty odd. But um, this Dell, so like I'm, I'm more or less housebound. And I depend on my husband to get me places. and. He's like the jailer. He's he's quite. Uh, he acts like a jailer as well. You know, he's just very abrupt and very stern, and and he makes the rules. And I, I just kind of I, I I'm doing my my quiet uh, my quiet devotion to Christ, so or to to my Father, and it, it softens him in a lot of ways um most recently he was angry at me because i enjoy getting on saturdays with jeff watching the movies and we've created uh, mighty camp companions in motion and there's a group of us and i love getting on with them um usually he's asleep so i can't really speak much when when we join but um I'm just so grateful for being able to join in this way. It was such a call for me because I felt so isolated, like Dale maybe. Um, and so it was interesting because it, I, I was so isolated and then here it opened up into these online retreats and it was like God heard my call and opened up these retreats for me from home. Um, anyway, I just, I really, really can identify with this Dell, and I don't know if I have anything else to say. I just appreciate you um, reading that letter, and I'm definitely going to write him and express my oh. gratitude. Thank you so much. Yeah, I feel your love, I feel your heart, and... Prayers are answered. That's the great witness you're sharing with us. You prayed for it, and, and what would really help you is really coming your way. And, and again, that's the way it works. Everything is offered us, and, and so little is asked of us. And you're just another beautiful witness of that for all of us. You're, you're, you're doing it for all of us. I was thinking about the, the theme of imprisonment as you spoke about Dale and I, 
I've been thinking much of my own experience and my own life, even uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm not in prison, but it sure feels like that sometimes anyway. So how the, how the imprisonment is really of the mind. And I'm thinking specifically of uh, right now with me having a child that is two years old and yeah, I mean, that's a kind of a lifestyle that is pretty, uh, well, fixed to a certain, uh, yeah, ritual and, and very much time bound and, um, and also just having, having to work and, and get up every morning the same time and come home the same time. And there's so much fixed fixity in the in the yeah in the days and I'm I, I was thinking so much about what you said yesterday also just doing things that out of inspiration and that you feel bring you joy and how I'm just finding myself in a position where I'm kind of restricted to do that um anyway it feels that way and I kind of I don't know, it's, I often find myself thinking that, that uh, it's my daughter's fault that I can't move on and, and do things differently. And on the other hand, I can see that thanks to her, she was born in 2016. That's, I mean, I can really see before and after with my spiritual journey because it was when she was born that I really moved forward a lot. Before then, I, I really just had had a, a relationship like on and off with the course reading sometimes and then a little bit again and then forgetting it for three months and then uh, going back. And then with her being born, and so much turning out how I didn't expect it. I was kind of forced. It was really forcing me to 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 look at things another way. And that's when I also started listening very much to you, David and Francis. So I mean, I can I can see that when I look at it more deeply. But but it but I still get caught in the thinking that every day when there are things arising like oh she's keeping me from this and that and she's the one that that makes it so difficult for me and and that binds me to i i mean i often feel the the sense that i'm kind of overwhelmed and, and i mean when i come home from work i'm i'm tired i want to rest and then I just, I mean, I can't rest. It's impossible. <laughs> she will need my attention and she will, she needs to eat and everything. So it's like, and then it take, it, it goes on. She, then it's time for her to sleep. And then it's like taking one or two hours to get her to sleep. And then it's like time for me to go to bed. So it's like, when, when will I have the time to focus on something else? So I don't know. I'm just trying to to express this how, how I, I really have this sense of being stuck, like being imprisoned in that loop, and I'm I'm just wishing to step out of it because, in a sense, I can see that I was it was something I heard Ricky saying. I saw this show, I think it was the latest one, Humble with Ricky. And she talked about like every say yes to what you have in front of you because everything that's presented to you that's that's like your path that's what's that's your assignment that's what you are supposed to move through and it's made for you so even if that rings true I still find myself going into the place like yeah that I want things to be different and I feel like there is something wrong with it like the way it is um, and I think there's also kind of an element of me feeling guilty for having her like like it would have been better if I didn't have her if I had done it right then I wouldn't have a child now then I would uh, yeah 
so kind of that that and uh, that thing too. And also that there is a lot of talk about leaving your children. And I'm like, what is that? Is that what is required of me that I just go and leave her? She's two years old. And so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know, maybe you can speak a bit to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I know too, it, it does relate to many people's situations where they seem to have have busy lives and lots of, of repetition and uh, responsibility and and I think it's if you bring it back into the mind it's like it's the it's the it's like a role every time we feel like we're confined and identified with a role like a caretaker role in this case uh, with a uh, there, there that's where the heaviness starts almost like there's there's a feeling of loss of freedom. Of um, of overwhelm, of uh, in, intensity that comes with that, and it's really that identification with that role. I remember I listened many years ago to a Course in Miracles teacher named Tara Singh, and uh, he he was into deep prayer. He worked with Krishna Murti for years, but I remember he would just get this beautiful, serene look on his face, and he would say, "Life takes care." Life takes care. And, and what I saw that is, is, is when we're able to see whatever is in front of us and whatever is our circumstances, is just our opportunity to let the care that is life come through us, then it, it starts to ease. We, st we don't feel so much like it's a role. It's almost like you, you got beamed into the situation and you're fresh, like, ooh. Okay, and there she is, and oh, I'm going to shower my love and, and my care. But once we kind of lock it into the time roll, uh, it starts to get, that's where the heaviness comes in. And, um, and also it's, it's kind of like that Bee Gees song, How Deep Is Your Love. The deeper we go into... Uh, the spirit, the spirit will take care and handle everything, absolutely everything in our perception for us to be, fulfill our function. Uh, there's some famous people throughout history like uh, Mary Baker Eddy is the founder of Christian Science. And uh, she had a child as well. And, but she went through all this seeming sickness and it was very intense and it just got worse and worse. It actually got so bad that the social services came and took her son away from her. And, uh, and off he went, he went out to, I think, Midwestern, maybe Oklahoma or something. It, he, she, he was given to another family. And, uh, and, and then after a lot of these years of sickness, she ended up writing this book, Science and Health with Key to the Scripture, which is very much uh, in parallel to the Course in Miracles in many ways. It was a huge transmission. That was her particular calling in this lifetime uh, back in the 1800s and early 1900s was to, to have this huge transmission come through her and to found the Christian Science Church, Church of Religious Sci Science, uh, Christian Science, and, and basically uh, we don't know. All we know is is that how deep is your love? How how deep am I willing to go to find that lasting peace of mind? You know, that's really the the question. Uh, in my early years too, when I had a group of students back in the 1990s, uh, yeah, it was that uh, TV show Married with Children. I, most everybody who showed up and said, "David, you are my teacher. I am your student," was married with children. So consequently, when we had our first little communities, we had children running around all the time, uh, and, and we were practicing the mind training, and we were practicing, I was working with the children on meditation, with the adults, with, with the Course in Miracles, and it was a very playful uh, situation with children around all the time and this and that. I remember they'd, they'd say, David, let's give you a haircut one time, and and one of my students, she said, I'm going to give David a haircut. Her son came along, and her son was giving uh, her instructions on how to, 
to uh, shave my head. And so one side goes off here, another side goes off here. I've got a mohawk. And the little boy, Matthew, was just squealing with delight. Look at David, he's got a mohawk. Of course, he's the one that's instructing his mother to give me a mohawk. But it's all part of that mind training. You know, it's, it's not like we are limited by anything of this world. It's just that when in our mind, when we start to click into the role, and we feel like this role defines us, and it's, it can be, uh, like you say, you're working and coming home for your daughter. I had a, 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 a counseling call with a friend of mine who's in uh, New Zealand uh, a couple, two or three days ago, and she works like full-time job, and she's got three small children, uh, and her husband left her, and she's into the Course, and she's into all of our Living Miracles stuff and, and everything. And she was like, can I, and the time difference, time zone difference with New Zealand, we were trying to just find a time to, to have a, a talk for half an hour, 45 minutes, and, and she found it impossible. The things were, after she got off work, she was going to daycare to pick up the baby, she's going here and there. She set a time, and then when I called her at the time, it was just her on her phone going, oh, I'm running late. And so she said, do you mind if I just, we, I, if you stay on the line, I'm, yep. So I went to the daycare with her, I went to pick up the, the student, at, her, her son and her daughter, and, and there it was, that was the whole call, with her phone flying all over the place, and, and that's all we could squeeze in was like 45 minutes of, uh, of half an hour in the van and, and the daughter throwing a tantrum in the middle seat, and then by the time she got home she went away just to spend like 15 minutes with me and talk about, because her, her uh, husband is filing something against her with the Hague Convention and all kinds of and, and all of her fear to really talk, and then the children were trailing behind her, and she was like, can you please give mommy a few minutes alone to talk to David? This is so important. It's like, my life is unraveling, but I, this is my life. I need to talk about what's going on. All I'm saying is, everybody does the best that they can, and, and I, if you just stay open to those little prompts, those guidances, those those little things that come in where you can relax, you can just pause and relax and, and let that roll go, then you're making huge strides on the spiritual journey inward. Because it's, it's always going to be that timeline roll that is always the thing that's heavy. And that's what's holding us back. And, and there are some rare cases where people are guided to leave their children, but it's, it's usually quite rare, but it, it, it has to do with the, the depth of the calling. There have been some books in India written of, of different mothers that, that were called into this deep experience. And, but, but generally, the Holy Spirit, most people are given a slowly evolving curriculum. And the, the, there's a part of the mind that goes, please, no, I don't want slowly evolving, <laughs> you know. But it's actually the most gentle and the most helpful thing, you know. That, so it's all coming at a pace that, that is manageable, that's, that's doable. So I'm, I'm just glad you're bringing this up because these are very important things. And I'm sure there's lots of people that are online here that are feeling some similar things around uh, time pressure and around role. And uh, you're, you're really helping by sharing that. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh. So sweet. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, so I lifted my handsome. So good evening, first. Um, I lifted my hand some time ago, and so much has been said since, um, and I'm really impressed how how well people deal with everyday lives because I'm so grateful that I have, don't have to deal with it anymore. Now for five, five months I'm retired and I can really fully do what I, what I like, which is, um, 
which is dealing with cause and miracles, reading it, living it, and so on. But this is not what I wanted to say in the first place. I was so, while David was reading the letter, I was so deeply touched and impressed because there was such wisdom in it. And it aroused, is this the right word in English? I don't know. It aroused in me such a knowledge, a kind of knowledge of, no, of no, knowing that there is something deeper which this man expressed in his letter. And he came this deep into the knowledge under circumstances I have no idea of. And um, I'm fortunate that I have never been in the situation, but he he reached this deep kind of consciousness or of knowing while being in such a, for me, such a terrible situation. So I was so impressed. And then I thought, um, sometimes we are complaining. It, uh, it is also mentioned in the course how difficult the learning of the course is. But um, compared to him, it's not, it can't be difficult at all with all the, the things we, we, we can um, we can use in everyday life, which makes learning this course easier. So um, it cannot be difficult for me anymore. Or no excuse that I cannot cannot learn the course, that I don't have enough time, that that I have not enough willingness. So there are no more excuses. So I'm I'm so grateful that David read this letter, and it was just at the right time. So I went was went just to say. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, I just tried to find some letter, um, some paper um, to write a letter to this man, and I found it. Um, it's a special letter because I'm in Europe, and it's by airmail, so it is normally thin paper. And um, so I, I've just found it, and so I want to write him a letter tomorrow so I can reach him for Christmas. Uh, so thank you so uh, much. Thank you yeah, so much for reading. It really touched me a lot and I, I, I could cry. But, but this is good. This is really good because the, is, this is some <laughs> uncovering of deep, deep things. I don't know what, but I don't have to know anything. I <laughs> just... <laughs> oh, beautiful. Beautiful. That's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Oh man, it, it resonated um, in so many ways for me. I had just a few days ago, I was watching some uh, choir performance, some music, uh, videos from the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. And I had gone to see a local uh, millennial choir and orchestra presentation. Just uh, amazing, beautiful voices just washing over me. I, I, I went back again the next day and I went back again the next day and I had a friend that was saying, man, you're obsessed with this. I said, oh, hey, man, I'm going to get another hit on that crack pipe. Man, that is good stuff. <laughs> and so they're, they're um, coincidentally, they're, um, I don't know if you can see that, but their, uh, their flyer was a child is born. And I just thought, okay, game on. And then I'm listening to you read that, read that letter. And um, a line that really struck me was, I am only concerned with going home. And man, that just poured in of like, that's it. That, that's it. That's, that's the only goal, the only, the, 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 the only thing. And as I'm listening to you read that letter, I'm thinking about um, Dale sitting there writing that. And, and then this, this phrase came to me as kind of like, well, how far is heaven? And I said, well, in miles, it's going to be this far. But as a crow flies, it's, it's, it's just right here, right now. And it seemed like the gist of his letter was just coming right into the, the portal, the portal of, 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 of seeing the, the, the fallacy of all the construct of the entire character-driven persona. And I've been watching um, Philip K. Dick's uh, Man in the High Castle lately, and it's just pulling me into Philip K. Dick type of uh, Gnostic, hey, you're, 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 you're not the character in the dream, wake up, and here's all the tyrannies of of Japan and Germany and the, the, the tyranny of the mind and the, and the man in the high castle is you. It's you. You're the man in the high castle. And just to how that's just been opening, opening, opening more of the, the truth as we discuss it all the time. But then you get those hits on that deeper realization of like, like game on. 
So I'm sitting here thinking, no, I'm going to communicate with Brother Dale, man. This is a great letter, and this is a beautiful um, opportunity in his experience there in the prison. It's, it's, it's so metaphorical. Of, like, it's, it's, not, it's my experience. It's all of our experiences. We're all trying to find the way home, the, the way out. And I looked over, and I bought myself a Christmas card that I really liked. And it's just a beautiful card. And I don't know if you can see this, but it's a, it's a Christmas tree. And, uh, and, and then it's just got all these hummingbirds floating around decorating the Christmas tree and hidden within the Christmas tree as a songbird. But it struck me as the symbol of the star, you know, being the inner, the inner awareness, the truth, the, the truth of, all, of the Christ. And then the hummingbird, is, as this community knows, is just highly symbolic of our perception shifting into the metaphor, into the symbols, into everything appearing based upon which feature we're choosing but I wanted to read this this is on the back of the card and I'm gonna send this to Dale when I saw this I looked over I thought no this is for Dale man <laughs> he's, he's gonna get this and he's gonna, that, uh, that prison um, mail service is gonna be really pissed off because they're gonna get a boatload of stuff and they're gonna think something's up with Dale <laughs> but let me read this it says, um, legends say that hummingbirds float free of time carrying our hopes for love, joy, and celebration. I love that, they float free of time. And that's what Dale was writing about, just being free, free of this thing, free of this structure. Carrying our hopes for love, joy, and celebration. The hummingbird's delicate grace reminds us that life is rich, beauty is everywhere, every personal connection has meaning, and that laughter is life's sweetest creation. And I just thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick that in there. I'll write him a note. I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate, I'm sure, as I like to do. But I've also got some other <laughs> ideas. But I just really appreciate um, the connection here. You sharing that letter, that was spot on. It struck, it struck me because there are all those fears of our own, uh, the, the, the claustrophobia, if you will, of, our, our, of, this, of this existence and, and our own prisons. And so here we have this shining exam example um, in, in our brother Dale and I, just a new meaning for, um, as a crow fly, man, you know, as a crow flies, uh, how far is heaven? Well, as a crow flies, it's right here, right now. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, you know, it, it, it did dawn on me too with this whole thing with, uh, with uh, Hurricane and with Dale and, and prisons because um, I've been traveling around the world and, and sharing the course for so many years, but I hear different things when I'm traveling. And, and there was a woman in Mexico City who, who got an early copy of A Course in Miracles, and um, she t turned it into a prison ministry where she went around uh, Mexico City and just got the book into the Mexico, Mexican prison system in a big way. And I would hear about her, and I would hear about this for years, and then I would hear about, there were even early releases, there was just all kinds of things that were happening, like a synergy around this. And I think to, it does have to do with, with the readiness uh, of our hearts, because um, also I've been to third world countries, and when I go off into the rural areas, uh, you know, this, this putting, the focus on returning home, the, the really putting the full focus on it, it seems to be a matter of readiness and it also seems that that in a lot of the real industrial, industrialized countries the distractions can be layered on so thick that it just like, uh, it's like that uh, parable Jesus told where the, se the seeds are sown but but some land, land among the thistles and and I see the thistles are, are all of these distractions of the world. I said, even though the seed lands, the seed is there, it can't, it doesn't really have the, the soil and the spaciousness to grow. So it's nice to know that, that we can all be touched by this and that we're all connected and that what one does is for everyone. And, uh, and to feel the joy in that this Christmas. And, and I'm always staying open to new ideas. I actually, 
Uh, you've been down here to Mexico, but I've been getting these thoughts the last few weeks about our La Casa de Milagros becoming like a Spanish hub uh, for Mexico and Central America, South America, because there is such a passion uh, to really know Jesus, to really come into a deep experience where people go through the whole patriarchal thing and they go through the craziness of penance and punishment, you know, the Catholic things, and they go, no, 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 that's not, that's not it, that's not it. And then their hearts are just cracking open like, I want to know the Christ. I want, I want to really know the real experience of Jesus. So uh, it's beautiful that you're sharing that, and I'm, it just looks like that's, that's going to stand out when, those, when he opens up all those things and sees that, that sparkling card that just caught your eye. Uh, it's so beautiful that you're, you're extending it to him, because I know, I could just see his face. He's just going to be smiling from ear to ear like, wow, <laughs> it's beautiful. Well, we're winding down here, uh, Jeff, because uh, we, we are going to stop uh, at the two-hour mark, and then you and I have to talk, because we have to talk about our movie coming up here, but how are we doing... Uh, Time-wise, with everything, a few more minutes. Do we have time for one more, one more person on here? Hi, hello. Uh, can, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, hi, Seema. Hi, hi. Thank you so much. Um, I I just was thinking about this idea of prison, and um, I wanted to just share, and and perhaps if you, if we have a minute, you could comment. So um, I've been sharing, I've been going through this uh, illness experience with my dad and the whole idea of how a prison can also be, because I, I was reflecting on what you said, um, look at what's going on outside of you and it's consciousness, it's consciousness to look at that and what are you valuing, what is your value? So um, and I was thinking, yes, what, what is it that I'm valuing? And, and it, it struck me that... Um, a role can be valued um, a, and that can become a prison. So, so the role of being a doctor and being the fixer, the one who can solve things and make it right and relieve suffering and, and, and then having um, an experience of your loved one going through something and it's not working, it's not working, whatever seems to be happening and all the guilt that arises and the anger and the frustration and that's certainly a prison, <laughs> you know, just being, being in that space of that belief that I, I am the one or I should be able to or because of what I know, blah, blah, blah. So um, I just wanted to just share that. And if you had any, anything you could, uh, any light on that, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. What's well, beautiful the way, you know, you've explored this so sincerely. And I do feel like... Um, uh, it's this, it is an expansive view of healing where we, we start to come, we lift it so much higher than, than the body, than persons, and we start to open up to how wondrous the healing of the mind must be. Uh, an impersonal healing where it's just so much joy and so much happiness and, and so much light. It's, in, in the context where we all start, where you've start, started as a medical doctor, uh, you know, is underneath it, there's still that love, that altruism, that want, that desire to help. And, and then I think even now with, with what's going on with your, your father, it's like, it's, it is more of a, a washing away of, of ideas and concepts, even around healing. Uh, it's and and that's really been your whole journey, where you've just you keep coming with open arms, saying, "Please show me. I need to know. I need to feel that depth, that depth, and that connection." And it just comes one wave at a time, and it's just been a really big wave. So it feels like this whole, it will affect your your self concept is going to be stretched and and shifted. I think through this whole thing, even. Uh, even your concept as a daughter, as a mother, as a health care, as a doctor, you know, all of it, it's almost like it's stretching, stretching wider and wider. And, uh, 
and just thank you for hanging in there with all this because this this is what it's all for and and your writing and reaching out was so helpful uh, the other day because um, that that just gives everyone here an opportunity to join with you and, and Jackie was so thrilled uh, actually that you had written and so the, it's like the gratitude just keeps spreading and the and the stretching and the keeps happening and we're all getting stretched to the point of uh, just this pure healing. So thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for sharing that and hanging in there with faith. Mm. Beautiful. Okay, well, what a session that flew by. <laughs> so we'll be back. We're coming back in a couple hours, I think, for our movie session. And uh, I think that'll be like about a three hour session. So hold on to your hat. We're gonna we're going deeper and deeper with this whole Beautiful expression. And Jeff's, I can tell Jeff you're looking forward to it. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. See you shortly.